located on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. This land is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Covenant between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of Ojibwe and Allied Nations. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work, live, and play on this land. So, our presenters today, again, like I said before, we have an all-star lineup. Uh, we actually have an all-star female lineup, uh, which I'm really excited about. Um, I've been at Special Olympics for a long, long time, and uh, I've had uh, the privilege of knowing uh, this group of educators for uh, pretty much the entire time that uh, that I've been involved at Special O. I started back in uh, 2012 um, in our school programs team, and uh, this group that we've compiled here today, amongst a bunch of others, have been kind of our core movers and shakers, our champions of the move of the movement. Uh, when we look at school programs, uh, I know when I started, uh, we were just starting um what we now call our school championships program it was called four corners back then um but uh, we had you know a couple of hundred uh school athletes that would participate uh in our stuff annually not a super formalized platform within schools um especially at the high school level uh, when it comes to competition and so we've evolved that since uh the 2011 2012 school year um, and uh, we're now uh, just over, we have about 11 to 12,000 athletes uh, that participate in our school programs between uh, kindergarten and university college each year. Uh, the bulk of that being in our high school uh, system. Um, and uh, this group of, of people here are a large reason as to why that program has been so successful. Um, I know we've got a lot of community volunteers on here today. Uh, and you all know that the Special Olympics movement and growth doesn't happen without all of your hard work on the ground. Uh, it's no different in schools. Um, our educators are volunteers as well, and uh, they've de dedicated a lot of their time to, to growing Special Olympics um, in their schools, in their class, and in their uh, local community. And so um, I couldn't be more excited to hear from all of them today. Uh, I've asked each of them uh, particularly to speak on a couple of different, uh, different areas. And so uh, we've got Amanda Mora here from Jay Clark, uh, which is out in Durham. Um, and Jay Clark has been uh, a powerhouse for, for our school programs uh, for as long as I can remember. They've got a huge group at their school that participates each year. I think they could actually host like their own qualifiers uh, if we let them. Um, but uh, we make them invite other schools as well to participate with. Uh, but they've been great, uh, particularly in floor hockey. They're a big powerhouse and they've got some big rivalries going across the province, which is uh, great to see. Um, and Amanda is going to speak to uh, that whole school engagement and some unified programming that they've got going on uh, at their school, which is really unique to them. Uh, then we've got Jen Kill from David and Mary Thompson. Uh, it's in Toronto. Um, Jen's got a really different approach to how they do unified. Uh, in Toronto using a leadership class um, and helping out with some other TDSB schools, uh, which is um, very, like I said, very unique. And it's also driven a lot of growth within uh, the TDSB, uh, particularly on the unified side. And uh, and again, getting that whole school uh, engagement piece going. And I know that uh, there's a lot of growth still to come out of there and uh, really excited for what our work with, uh, with that group is going to lead into, especially within Toronto. Um, Lindsay's joined us from West Humber, which is out in Etobicoke, uh, and um, they've done a really good job uh, working with us for a long time, but also during COVID being um, having some really unique uh, involvement look in how they uh, enable their school uh, as well. And then uh, Janice and Diane are here from Maplewood High School, which is in Scarborough. Uh, and uh, they do a lot of things really well at their school, but uh, in particular, they do uh, some really good fundraising things uh, that allows their students to participate uh, in more stuff um, than they would have been otherwise. So uh, they're all going to speak to a couple of uh, those points, but as well as, you know, a whole gauntlet of things that involve Special Olympics. Uh, in their schools. Um, and again, uh, if you have questions that, you know, are about what they talked about or about something else completely different, uh, feel free to, to ask away at the end. Our panelists have all been very kind and uh, they're gonna stick around uh, right until the end. And they're all here live with us tonight, which is uh, a bonus for us as well. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that's enough for me. Uh, I just, uh, I'll start by introducing Amanda and uh, yeah, Amanda, take it away. 
Hi, everyone. So like Kristen said, I uh, teach at J. Clark Richardson. So we're out in Durham. And uh, we have the second largest school in Durham. We have about 1800 students and seven small classes. So uh, we have about 70 students in our small class program, which we use to um, do our Special Olympics programs. Um, in our department, we have 10 teachers and 19 EAs. So that gives us a good amount of coaches too, to run our program. And um, we've been participating in the Special Olympics since I got to Richardson in 2014, and we've attended every provincial since. And um, the students at our school um, are obsessed with Special Olympics. They love it. They want to do it all day, every day. Um, and part of what we've been um, working on at Richardson is uh, growing our program to not just our small classes, but to make that unified program um, bigger um, and to kind of get more uh, you know, growth in the, in the program by getting more exposure so that the other 1800 students in our school know what's going on. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna speak to is how we promote Special Olympics within the school and how we create an accepting culture that celebrates our athletes and their accomplishments. Um, so the first uh, thing we decided to do was make sure our students looked like a team. I didn't like the idea of our students wearing just like the hand-me-down, whatever was left in the back of the storage closet um, uniform. So I advocated to our admin to purchase um, a set of uniforms for our students. And um, I also gave students the option if they wanted to buy their own with their name and number on it. And um, our school is so big that we don't do morning announcements. So another uh, way that we promote Special Olympics within our school is utilizing school social media. So our school has Facebook, Instagram, TikTok accounts that are all uh, shared with the Richardson coaches. So I advocated to um, be a part of that. I said, hey, can I do posts about our kids and what we're doing? And so that's been a great way to um, promote what we do and our students' accomplishments. And um, just things too, like we have a school mascot, his name is Stormy, it's a lightning bolt and we bring him to all the events and um, the kids love that. And we get them to, you know, tag on social media and that just gets our team and our events seen by more people. Um, our school also has a social media team, which is pretty cool. So I invite those students to everything and anything I can and um, also use them to help us make videos for social media to promote events. So like if we're doing a pizza fundraiser, for example, um, they're very savvy with those kinds of things and they make cool videos to help bring attention to it so that we can raise more money at our events. I'm also not shy about contacting local media. So um, I'm constantly emailing our school media team, our school board, um, the, the local paper, anyone who will listen to tell them about events we're doing, because uh, the more exposure, the better. And sometimes they get us to just send them a story or sometimes they send in their own journalists. And um, that's even better because then we're guaranteed to get some pictures and articles either in the paper or on TV or online, whatever. Um, a small thing that we started, which has a huge impact, is the clap-ins and clap-outs for major events. So basically, um, that's something I know some schools do, but I encourage everyone to do it. And with permission from the admin, we invite as many uh, mainstream students to align the hallways. And um, as our students are leaving for an event, you know, they do a clap out, um, high fives, cheers, whatever, and just really hype up our students and they love it. Um, and then when we return from events, we do a clap in. So our students walk in with their ribbons, their medals, their banners, whatever they got. And um, it just really has um, increased just our students' understanding of, you know, these students went to an event and they did compete and they did win. Um, and that's been great for our culture uh, because a lot of the students now, 
you know, recognize our students as athletes and not just, oh, the kids in the hallway over there. Um, so Kirsten's going to slide through a bunch of photos that I've sent her. And um, another uh, way that we promote Special Olympics in our school is we advocated for display case uh, space in the phys ed hallway. And in there, I put ribbons, medals, pictures, anything in there to kind of promote um, our program. And even artifacts from our students who participate outside of school, uh, just so that they can feel proud, like they're a part of the, the school and the winning team and the culture. Um, and a major push that we did at our school was actually including our Special Olympic athletes in the athletic banquet um and the yearbook and giving them major awards um the decision to do this has really started to showcase our athletes and their achievements so at our athletic banquets we do team mvps for every sport so bocce floor hockey basketball soccer and track whether or not they make it to provincials or not um, and this is voted by the coaches and teammates and um, we also do major awards. So we do a male and female athlete of the year award. And we also have started doing a unified athlete of the year award. And I think this one is, it's fairly new, but it's a great way to reward our unified athletes who also put a lot of time and effort and you know training into this for our students. And our unified athletes also gain um, points towards getting their athletic letter at graduation, which is another push that um, we made to encourage students to get involved. And um, like I said too, with the yearbook, um, each of our teams now has their own yearbook page, which is pretty cool um, because you know on team picture day, they get called down to the gym, just like every other team, they get to put on their uniforms, take their picture, and it makes them feel so proud. So I'm really happy about that. Um, something that's important for exposure uh, that we've been trying to work more with our community partners is setting up tables at um, parent-teacher interviews, community nights, transition nights, feeder school visits. Um, and this is because a lot of our parents have said that they love the school program, they love that their kids are participating, but then when they graduate, they're not quite sure what to do or they don't know how to get them involved outside of school. Um, so on any night or occasion where we know parents are gonna be coming into the school, we set up a booth and have our athletes, both unified and SO, um, man them and try to, you know, point parents in the right direction of where they can sign their athletes up outside of school as well. Um, something else our school has been working on doing is utilizing the curriculum in other classes to both program for and to promote our Special Olympics program. Now I know someone else is going to speak to this so I, I won't talk too much about it. Um, but in our school, we definitely use um, classes, so leadership, um, senior phys ed classes, um, to help us host Special Olympics events and also help them coach students at qualifiers. Uh, in the curriculum, you can find lots of um, examples of uh, where leadership, um, helping other students is part of the phys ed curriculum. So it's an easy uh, sell for me when I talk to teachers. And it also really helps us out to have a lot of students at these events because, uh, you know, inevitably someone always needs to go to the washroom or something. Uh, so this has really helped us. But we've also branched out to have these classes help us with other events too, like Autism Awareness slash Acceptance Month or um, fundraising opportunities. So like we ran a dunk tank at a fun fair. Um, and these are ways to utilize other students in the school. Um, we also talk to our integration teachers about letting our students talk to their classes about things they've done. So if they've went to a big event and they've won, you know, taking two minutes, three minutes to stand in front of the class at the beginning and show their medal is just another way to promote our program. Or like you see pictured here, some of our students were part of the TFC unified team. So just to talk about that opportunity, they got to go to Chicago or Atlanta, like that's a pretty big deal for them. 
And um, it just makes the school a better place when everyone can share their experiences. And uh, the, the last thing we've been working on is recruiting unified athletes that will help the Special Olympics program grow. So when we first started, we didn't really know what to expect with unified. So we just recruited siblings of our Special Olympics athletes. So we knew they'd be comfortable with students with disabilities because they had a sibling. So I said, hey, you come with a couple of your friends and play basketball with your brother or sister. Um, but when we went to our first provincials, we realized what a big deal this unified program um, was and what a life changing experience, not only for our Special Olympics athletes, but for our unified partners. So we've really focused on growing this aspect and now our school leans more towards unified than traditional sport. So now we speak to our phys ed department and our integration teachers about who works well with our students, because that's number one. Our students um, don't like to be treated different. They want to be treated, you know, the same as any other athlete in the school. So that's a big thing. Um, they don't need someone to, you know, always just roll the ball to them so they can get it. Like they want to be competitive. So that was that's important for us when we're recruiting. Um, I also started attending like, the student club meetings. So I went to the athletic council, the student government, the leadership team, and I said, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what I need. And um, I offered reference letters because I said, is anyone going into teaching post-secondary or looking for a summer camp job? This is a great resume builder. Um, I used to do that. Now I have kids coming to me, which is great. So I don't have to recruit as much. And um, I have to actually turn kids away because I have so many, which is amazing. Um, and the last thing we've been doing to get unified athletes is speaking to coaches of school teams. So we're asking them, you know, who's that student who may not have made the team, but still has a, you know, a lot of skills. Here's an opportunity for them. So maybe they got cut from our basketball team, you know, maybe we can include them on our unified basketball team or who's a student on your team who needs a little bit of a, a push to develop those leadership skills. And um, that's also been really great. And it helps us as special education teachers also meet more of the 1800 students in our school, which has also been pretty awesome because we have some amazing students at our school and um, the unified program has definitely been, like I said, life changing for everyone. And sometimes I think our unified partners actually gain more um, from volunteering with us than, than our students. So it's been great. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all for me. I feel like I just talked a lot and um, I put my email as my name so that if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to email me or um, you can wait till the end and ask. Thank you guys. Thanks, Amanda. That's perfect. Thank you. And I nailed the timing, I think, a couple of times on the slides. And it's like we practiced all afternoon. It was great. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Jen here from David and Mary Thompson. Jen, take it away. Hi. Uh, I hope everyone's having a good day. Um, so I am uh, coming out of when I talk about Special Olympics or about PLF. I'm coming from a different perspective. I'm actually uh, the head of phys ed at my school and I am a full phys ed teacher at my school. I, I, so I don't actually um, teach in our DD and ISP program. So it is quite different. Um, I'm, I'm fairly new to Special Olympics as I've just moved into the school about four years ago and I've saw this large program happening. And our school is one of the largest um, uh, programs in terms of DD students. We have about 60 students. And then on top of that, we have about just this last year, we um, the, our neighboring high school shut down. So we, we amalgamated schools and we've also absorbed now about 120 students that are MID as well. So we have a very large program at our school. Um, our school itself is, uh, we, we literally just moved into a brand new building. As you can tell, the pictures are very different <laughs> gyms, but it is the same, it's, uh, the same school in essence. Um, so at Thompson, I do teach the uh, PLF leadership course, which is the grade 12 recreation and healthy active, uh, healthy active living leadership course. 
And at Thompson, we actually do like we run our leadership course a little bit differently. We focus more on adaptive physical education. So this time the PLF students are actually learning leadership skills by working one on one with DD students and hosting large events. So in terms of I, I know some of my colleagues in the Toronto District School Board run their uh, P PLF courses where they host events in their school, like intramurals, they might host tournaments. And so this is where uh, a very different uh, kind of program where I work with my students for about a month and we learn about leadership and communication skills. And then afterwards, for the rest of the semester, my students are actually in gym with their uh, with the DD and ISP students. Um, and so as the head of the department, it's actually quite nice because I can block off um, so for us, it's period two, every, every year, period two throughout the entire school year, that class is dedicated to PLF. So we do offer two sections of PLF, which is great, which means and allows our, uh, our ISP students to have gym year round, which is fantastic for them. So, and, and they get to meet new people, new partners. And so it's a kind of a great way to introduce the, the students to it. So. I'm also kind of lucky because I get the class list beforehand, so I can also pick and choose the students. But on every year, I have about 65 students who are in this leadership course, which is great. I mean, it's over two semesters, so about 30 students a semester. Um, in terms of gym time, so I think it makes a big difference when leadership students get to make the choice. So our students get to kind of choose the partners that they want to work with. They get to run different activities in the, sorry, Kirsten, in the last slide, I, I don't know if you saw, but we actually brought in like a rock climbing unit or the other one before. I actually was able to bring in a rocks, a ropes and wall climbing unit into the school for every senior phys ed student. And because of that, we also allowed all of our DD and ISP students to participate and they got to actually climb the walls of the school. We had a full zip line going through our school. And what was amazing was that our leadership students took responsibility for our students and were the ones that were encouraging them and making sure that they climbed up. Some of our students couldn't actually climb up, so they're literally hoisting them up to the top of the ceiling. It was fantastic. So our students are really dedicated in that and our course lends perfectly with that. And because of this course um, and working with all of these students and because most of them are grade 12 students, we are able to actually host events as well. Um, whether it's for uh, Special Olympics. So when I first got into it, I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. And I, I called and asked and said, what do I do? How do I, how do I get an event running? How do, I, how do I ensure my DD students have a place to participate? And how can I get my leadership students involved? So my leadership students were actually the ones who were running the events, show, uh, timers. They were the ones marshalling students. They might've been showing students how to do specific things which was great because I, I actually had four other schools at this event. I had my leadership students and because I'm a head of department, I'm also meet up regularly with other heads of departments from other high schools and literally said, hey, I need your PLF students to help me out. And now I'm actually able to get PLF students from across the TDSB to help host events for Special Olympics and for events that uh, the TDSB actually runs for our uh, students. So it's fantastic now that we're not just doing it in our classrooms, uh, we're able to expand outwards and bring PLF students and leadership students so that they're not just hosting things at their school for their school, for their students, they're hosting it board wide and city wide for our students, which is great. Like they're meeting new friends, they, our leadership students are actually learning basic skills so that um, when I, so I often also host a lot of officer championships. So I recently hosted the officer swim and the officer track. I could actually now use my PLF students to also help me at those events as well, because they've had that experience with Special Olympics. I can now say, hey, Ofsa, I have these students that have this experience, let's use them. So it's been really great having these leadership courses and using uh, the course in an adaptive format to not only build relationships in the school, but to also build relationships within our community, if that makes sense. So on the, um, sorry, on the next slide, sorry. So what, on top of, so when I first started 
I, I was hosting one event and then I was like, okay, well, I don't know what to do. So let's have our students like host an event and maybe I'll pull one or two students to actually play as part of a unified team. That's kind of how we started. And then because I was again, able to get more PLF students, my students no longer have to host the event. My students can actually be the unified partner. They get to actually go around and help. There's a, they get to play as well. So that's great. And now we have leadership students from across the board helping out, which is fantastic. I do also, um, there are some schools in the board that have congregate settings. So where they're all, um, kind of like what Maplewood has, where they're all um, Special Olympics athletes, and but yet they don't have unified partners. So what I'm able to do now is actually provide a unified partner for some of those teams and some of those schools. So now that now they can have both a traditional and a unified team, which has really helped their schools and their athletes, their students participate more. I'm able to send my students to leadership events like at the youth games in Toronto. Um, the, the five kids at the top, I didn't, I didn't have to be at the event with them. They knew what to do. They helped organize, they helped uh, at the event itself. So it's kind of nice to be able to train students to be able to do that so that when they leave the course, when they reflect on the course, they've learned all sorts of different skills that they might have, might have learned if they'd done a traditional PLF, but with a adaptive form of PLF, it does allow for greater opportunities for our students to learn a greater opportunity for our students to share and to share with their school friends, friends at different schools, which has been phenomenal. Um, yeah, so we, so sometimes even if I run out of students, I, we, we kind of split students and go here, you go play for them. Um, in addition, as part of athletics, I, I sit on a lot of committees for the TDSB for athletics and another um, division that we have that I know Janice and Diane will speak about later. Um, we do have an athletic league that is geared for all students with intellectual and developmental abilities. So students across the Toronto area um, we'll get to compete at different sports, different tiers, different events throughout the year. So not only do they have their five Special Olympics events, but they also have separate events um, for our students. And this is a great opportunity for leadership students to also um, to be used. So I've, I've used my PLF students as coaches. Um, I've used them as hosts. So for example, we um, there's this large cross-country meet that we have it in about October. We go to Sunnybrook Park. There's about 400 special needs students there. And then we've got leadership students that are kind of placed throughout the forest so that they're acting as marshals for our students so that everyone kind of knows what's going on. So it, it, it's been a really great um, opportunity for the PLF students and the leadership students to see what is happening in their world and to see what could be uh, what, what is exposed to them. And not only are they seeing it from the, the perspective of their schoolmates of seeing their special needs students, but they're also seeing it from their own partners. They can see how some students are interacting with others. And, and, and I think one of the best reflections I've ever read from a student was um, she wrote, I'm so surprised that the student in our class is is so different in our class. Usually he's a very tough and rough student, but to see him dancing to Taylor Swift with his ISP partner is the greatest thing I've ever seen and makes, makes me realize and understand that all of us have different things going on in our world. So that kind of really put it together of what's happened in our PLF course and in our school. So PLF is by far one of the most popular courses in our school. It's There's a waiting list to get into that class, which is fantastic um, and students who don't get in um, if in grade if they want to be in the course in grade 12 they have to volunteer in grade 11 and we, we're getting bigger and bigger numbers so that at lunchtime now we have intramurals for our mainstream students on one side and we do have um, our other students who are training for their division six and we have volunteers coming in and helping out who who want to learn, who want to be with their, either their partners or who want to be in the PLF leadership course. So we run it very differently. It is a great way to see um, the unification of both programs running at our school, which has been phenomenal. Um, so if you have any questions about PLF or the leadership course or using athletic council students, please let me know. You're welcome to email me and I'm happy to help out.
Thanks. Thanks, Jen. That was perfect. All right. Oh. Broken it. Next up, we've got Lindsay from West Humber. Lindsay, the floor is all yours. All righty. Um, hi, everybody. So uh, my name is Lindsay Culver, and I'm from a school uh, called West Humber. We are a school in uh, Etobicoke in Rexdale in Toronto. And my school is a smaller team, so we only have three classes and not all the students in all the classes participate. Um, we have students of varying abilities and um, yeah, so we're, we're a smaller group, but we are mighty. Um, so we started playing five years ago. I started at the school. Uh, I, I joined second semester. And so that's when we started. We, we just played bocce that year. And we practiced at lunchtime in the hallways. And we managed to qualify for provincials, which was great. Um, but unfortunately, that year, because I had just started second semester, um, parents didn't have, I didn't have strong relationship with the parents and I couldn't get enough parent support to trust me to take their child overnight. Um, and I think they were just nervous. A lot of, not, I, well, none of my students had ever been away. So that year we, we didn't get to go to provincials, but then the next year uh, we played three sports, soccer, bocce and track and field. And um, that year I would practice when the gym was not being used by the mainstream students. So we are an integrated school. There are mainstream students um, like, like Jen's. Uh, and if they were in health class, sitting at desks in a classroom, that's when we got to use the gym. The phys ed teacher would say, gym is open, you can have it today. So we would go and practice. And that year was the first year we went to provincials. I managed to convince all the parents that it was uh, gonna be fine. And we went to Peterborough and it was amazing. Uh, it was all of the kids first time being away from home. And uh, it was a great experience for the staff, for the students and for the families. It, it, it really, um, they, I mean, it, they got some respite, but also um, just the confidence that their kids could live without mom and dad doing everything for them or looking after them. So that was great. Um, and then the following year we did four sports and that year I was like enough of this trying to get into the gym whenever I can we need we need a set uh, space so there's a community center that's about 10 minute walk from our school and I went over there and just said listen um is there a time when you your gym is free and can we use it so um they said yes we got to go twice a week in the mornings and uh, it was a small space but it was a space so um we couldn't use their equipment that was the only downside so we had to we bought a little cart and we would trek it over um to the community center and that uh, it worked out really well um and that year we did host a basketball tournament at our school. So I did manage to get our school gym for that, which was awesome. It, it exposed a lot of our students who didn't see our kids because we practiced in the community center. Um, a lot of the students in our school didn't really know other than the occasional announcement about, you know, if we had attended an event and the results. Um, so it really brought it into the school and more visible. And then that year was the year we went to the youth games in Toronto, which was also awesome. Um, and it, by this point, it was much easier for me to get parents on board. We had the kids from the year before who had gone and then some new ones who joined us. And it was amazing. We had a track team and a bocce team. And uh, yeah, it was great. Some of the families came out because it was in Toronto. Um, so they were able to watch them play, uh, which was amazing. And then we came to last year, which was when we had our first unified team. We did basketball unified. Um, I was coaching the mainstream junior boys basketball team. So I just asked some of the players um, if they would play with us and they did. They came to our um, practices. And in the second semester, we managed to get our own period in our school's gym, which was amazing because it meant we didn't have to trek over to the community center and we could just use the school equipment. So that was much easier. Um, and we did qualify to go to provincials in Kingston last year, but, and parents were very much on board, but unfortunately uh, COVID ruined everything. 
Oops. Um, so the top left there is the community center that we were in, and then we have our soccer team. Um, we, this is from the basketball team we hosted, or basketball tournament we hosted at our school. We made a little Twitter thing. And then the bottom left are two pictures from our Peterborough Provincials and then our, our very cool basketball team. Um, so I won't go into, I was going to go into this more, but I think I'm going to make it more generalized because there's community, more community people here. Um, but just in general, a typical phys ed schedule for us before the pandemic, um, we would focus on one activity or sport for two weeks, just building on skills and playing games related to the skills. So it was really only the last day or two that we would actually play a game of whatever it was we were doing. We would be working on individual skills and playing little mini games up until that point. Um, and then we would put all the skills together at the end and put it into a game. And then whenever there was a special Olympics competition coming up, so if there was a basketball um, competition coming up the week uh, or the two weeks before, sometimes three weeks for a sport that we needed to really practice our skills on, um, we would, that's what we would focus on in gym. So if it was basketball three weeks before, we're going to be doing basketball every day. If it was bocce, we're going to be doing bocce every day for gym, uh, whatever sport was coming up. And then in between when there wasn't a special Olympics event, we would look at other um, activities. So there in that picture, we're playing cricket in the, at the community center. Just more photos of us, some track and field. That's our bocce team in the top right. Uh, basketball at our school, some of our students dancing, and then some track and field picks. Okay, so how it has changed for us this year due to the pandemic. So the real bonus for us is that the school is empty in the afternoons. The mainstream kids are done at 1230. Um, so although no one's in the school now, but um, before, when we did have kids coming into the school, they're done at 1230. The gym is free in the afternoon. So we got the gym for the first year every day, all year, which was amazing. Uh, the drawback was we are not allowed to share the gym materials. So um, they, the way our phys ed, phys ed department did it is every class got their own equipment and there was no sharing in between the classes. Um, so we didn't have any equipment to play with. Um, and I also have to clean the gym before and after we use it. So a little extra time for me. But um, so we just changed it up this year. Uh, normally we would do sports and I can tell you my students are missing playing sports, but um, we changed it to things we could do with no or minimal equipment and always social distancing because I do, not all my students are great at wearing masks, particularly when we're practicing we're doing phys ed um, and they're not great at social distancing. So I tried to pick things that um, had social distancing kind of built within them. Um, so that's our schedule this year, Monday dance, Tuesday yoga, Wednesday fitness, Thursday martial arts, and then Friday games. Um, and I have been hybrid teaching. So right now I have some students at school and some students at home. So that is something I have had to adapt to. Um, and then there's been times where we've all been home. We did have a COVID, uh, two COVID cases in our program. So both those times we were all sent home. So we were doing phys ed from home. Um, so yeah, it has been an adjustment. So looking at what we've been doing then for when we have Special Olympics competitions, um, we practice on Friday games day. We are allowed to use the equipment on that day because none of the other students would be back in the building till Monday. So the phys ed department was like, it's fine if you use it on Fridays. Well, we do have to clean it, but that's fine. Um, and I did, I did make it so that if we were hybrid or virtual, um, no, actually only when it was hybrid. If we were all virtual, then we did it virtual. But only students who are in school participate in the competition, just because it was too tricky for me to navigate between trying to have the ones at home and, and the ones at school. Um, last year when we were doing things a bit differently, it wasn't um, like live teaching every day. Uh, I would send stuff home to the families, but there was very little uptake on them running things. So it really needed to be initiated by me. Um, 
so it was tricky with the students at home although they did so i would have them like when we did the basketball passing competition and we had them counting from home um or just cheering us on so that middle picture is really personifies uh Special Olympics and phys ed for me this year. It's a smart board monitor that has some of the students uh, at home and then a little cart of our equipment with my laptop attached to it. Uh, that is phys ed. So yeah, last year I was doing YouTube videos. So I would do a YouTube lesson and then send it in an email every week and say, do this YouTube lesson. Uh, when you're home, we did a like soccer, or I mean, bocce with socks and um, other some other sports skills. A lot of my students like didn't have a soccer ball at home, didn't have a basketball at home. So I couldn't be, you know, ask them to do that. Um, so it was just whatever you have at home, use it and participate that way. So that was what we did in the spring. And then this, now that it we're this school year, um, because it's been live teaching. Um, the students at home, I'm able to better monitor and, and have them doing it with me, which is which is really nice. And then we've 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 adapted to doing just different skills and a lot more chair things. So like chair yoga and chair, uh, what did we do? Chair, chair fitness things. Um, so that has been the adaption there. And then I also bought uh, in that left picture, you see there's a little rubber um, circle. I don't know what spots, I forget what they're called. I bought them off on Amazon and I bought one for each kid and that is their spot. And they know that that is where they're supposed to be and they're not supposed to move from that spot. So whether we're doing passing a uh, soccer ball in the soccer field or we're doing body weight workouts in the gym, that spot is always their spot. And I found that has worked um, really well for keeping them as best we can socially distant. And uh, same thing with the yoga mats. That's, that's their space. And they know that they can sit there, they can whatever. Um, but I just space them all out. And yeah, I think that's, oh yes, the future, right. Um, so what I'm hoping for our school for the future is hopefully to have more unified teams. It's looking like next year, we're gonna be in cohorts again. So I'm not sure what that's gonna look like for us, but hopefully. <laughs> um, the one sport we haven't participated in is floor hockey um, because equipment has been a problem for us. So hopefully, finally nailing down that equipment and uh, being able to participate in floor hockey. And then just lastly, having it really built into our school's culture. It is to a certain extent, we go to the athletic banquet, um, they, get a, they get their own awards. Uh, we have a school athlete of the month every month. And one of our students won it last year, which was like a big, it's a big deal to win athlete of the month. You get a t-shirt and then those kids wear those t-shirts like they're four years and you're you get high fives in the hallway. So it was a big deal. So they are accepted um, in that sense. And we get our own uniforms, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it really is me driving it. Uh, I run the phys ed classes. So we have three programs, all three kids classes come and I'm the teacher who's running it. The other teachers are more supporting. Um, and I've been the one to take all the students to the competition. So my hope is that, um, I can make build it stronger in the in the school so that if I'm not there, uh, it continues. I don't want it. I certainly don't want it to die with me, and I don't think it will. Um, it is pretty built in at this point, but um, yeah, that that's my future goals. And I think that's it for for me. So yeah, uh, if anyone has any questions, my name is also my email, or I'll look forward to them at the end. Thanks, Lindsay. That looks fantastic. All right, our last presenting uh, group that we're going to be presenting together, although Janice, I hear you're taking the lead. Uh, so we'll see how this goes and how many times you tap on Dan, but uh, Janice and Diane from Maplewood, the floor is all yours. Perfect, thanks, Kirsten. I'm just uh, I'm just going to quickly mention that uh, I am currently the uh, ACL of the uh, the phys ed department at Maplewood. Also, I do a lot of other things. Diane in the past has had the role as well. So we together uh, 
are a great team. Uh, Diane is currently retired, but is not giving up and continually helps us out. She's only been retired for a couple of years. So uh, her involvement in Special Olympics continues uh, today. Um, so Maplewood High School, we are called the Wolverines. There is another team up in the north that is called the Wolverines as well. I think it's Sault Ste. Marie. Diane can confirm that after. Uh, we are in the east region of Scarborough. So we're in Toronto. We're down at Morningside and uh, Kingston Road area, which is Although it is, uh, we are located there, many of our students are bused in. They are not local. Okay, Jamie can go, or we can go to the next slide, Kirsten. Uh, we are a congregated special needs school. We have about 150 students, of which uh, 75 of those are developmentally delayed, and 75 of the others are uh, multiple intellectual disabilities. Uh, they range from 14 to 21 year olds. And we have a total of 110 staff for that number of students, but it's it's more uh, it's needed hugely. We have 30 teachers. So out of the 110 staff, 30 teachers, the remaining staff are EAs, SNAs, and CYWs. And all of these people help us with uh, Special Olympics and helping the students um, get involved, which is awesome. All right. Uh, so how it all began. So uh, in uh, 2016, hey, we need our next uh, slide. Long, arrived as principal with an extensive background with Special Olympics, both as a coach and a parent. And he is the one actually, he introduced us to Kirsten and got us involved right away in becoming participants uh, with our athletes in Special Olympics. Uh, and then Diana, I'll let you take it over from here. Okay, and um, I mean, our, our school's very unlike all the other presenters because, um, it's it's a congregated site. I think the TDSB still has about four schools similar to ourselves. It used to be about twelve, um, but the push has obviously gone to integration. Um, but the good thing was was that we had been running our own league and division for students with intellectual disabilities for years. I mean, like thirty years. So there was um, we already had the structure in place. You know, some of the things I hear Amanda and um, Lindsay talk about, it almost breaks my heart to, to hear them speak about having to fight for gym time and for uniforms and, and things like that, because our experience was that was just a given. So we had um, people who knew how to coach. We knew people who ran leagues, conveners. Then we got this principal. And it was just the perfect marriage for us to become involved with Special Olympics. And we had the student body. Yeah, we can go on to the next slide. Yeah. So as you can see here, I won't read all of this, you can read it yourselves, but when Duncan arrived, then this is when it all started with us participating in the Special Olympics. And wow, did we ever uh, have great opportunities. Um, we were, um, we made the provincials every year in different sports, but our highlight of course was when the World Youth Games came to Toronto. Um, Kirsten was a huge, in, had huge involvement in that, but she also involved our principal. He was on the, the planning committee. So that gave us tons of opportunity to promote the event. Um, and we make more so like than perhaps the other schools, we did have a little bit of inside in getting those opportunities. So uh, our, our students benefited hugely, but it also allowed Special Olympics to become more visible in our community, um, which is great. And this is, Diane, do you wanna go through this slide? Um, sure. So, um, you know, Special Olympics, I, all of you, I know I'm speaking to people who, who know all this very well, but some of the benefit for our students, as we said, we already had an athletics program in place, but the opportunity to meet kids from all over the province, as we said, and, and like, yeah, there's kids up in Sault Ste. Marie wearing a Wolverine shirt who look and act like me. It was, it's so beneficial. Um, you know, being parts of the opening ceremonies, those were things we weren't previously able to provide. Um, I was got a call on a Monday and on a Thursday, I was at a workshop with students with the women's national soccer team. And so, um, you know, Special Olympics has just provided so much on top of what was already there for the students. So, and this we'll talk about some of the fundraising stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, 
so this is Diane and I were thinking more for for uh, teaching uh, talking to teachers in this particular uh, slide and I know we have a lot of volunteers so you won't get hung up on it but as you know in order for any of anything to run in a school it requires a lot of support so um, this was just more so talking to teachers that you know being able to reach out if you're not in the phys ed department finding the phys ed department making sure that you have their support obviously uh, you need gym space or you need equipment finding all of that and turning to that person would be important. Also, we found the paperwork extremely challenging time time wise. So we luckily, as you saw before, we have a lot of support staff. So the paperwork alone um, is often done by someone else other than the coaches because the coaches are having to just manage the kids so much. Um, and our and of course, the administration has to buy in as as the other pre presenters have mentioned as well, you need that support in order to run and we also uh, money is a big thing which we're going to talk about in a minute because we do not have money so fundraising is huge for us. But finding the money out of the administrators is often really challenging for us and uh, Diane you can talk to the about the cheerleader. <laughs> So, I mean, um, and again, uh, Lindsay and Amanda and Jen uh, touched on this. Well, I, again, we have a very unique staff and a lot of really awesome people, but so does every school and so does every community. And it's just tapping people on the shoulder. Y you know, for example, we have a, a colleague who um, she's the best glitter gun lady you would ever meet. And we just had to tap her on the shoulder. Joe, could you make some signs for us? Next thing you know, that person is involved and they've taken it on and they're organizing the clap-ins, the clap-outs. Um, you know, reach out to your caretaker, reach out to, you know, your school secretary, someone. There's so many people. We, we actually have to turn coaches away because people want to do it so much. Um, yeah. So yeah, we can go on to our next slide. We're trying to keep this short for you yeah. guys. So just for us, um, some of the barriers that we face, uh, again, it's economic uh, issues because our kids are bused in, they are, many of them are, are very poor. Um, they can't even afford a lunch. When we go to the events, we have to often bring food for them. Um, when, we, when we were, one, one of really frustrating incidents was when we were up in Peterborough for our provincials. I just remember us, we were out late it was a late night. I think we were at the closing ceremonies and we came back at 10 o'clock and the kids were hungry and all these other schools are ordering pizzas. And we're like, we don't even unfortunately have a budget for that. So we, I mean, and of course we're, we're, we're paying out of our pockets and we do not mind, but just, we don't have money. And that's the most frustrating thing for us. Um, and again, transportating students, if we, we can't do anything, obviously after school, we are uh, have to run everything at lunchtime and, and that's okay too. I know the other schools mentioned as well, they do the same uh, because all our kids are bust and it's impossible to get our parents often to come pick them up because they don't have the means. Um, and anxiety, a lot of times the, the kids have a lot of anxiety and the parents over sending their student or their athletes to any of the events that aren't at home. So, and culturally as well. One thing, um, if you're not in education, you may not know, but schools are funded based on a per head basis. Um, and so with only 70 students at our school, the budget is so small. Um, sometimes a larger school, there might, the teams might benefit from being at a school with 1700 kids because there is more money directed from the province. But again, we're, we're not crying the blues. Um, but it's just the reality and we have to be really sensitive to our families because as, as Janice said, very few of our families even have a car. So when you say, oh, can you get your kid to the school at 7 a.m.? No, they can't. So we have to be creative around that. Um, so we've done lots of fundraising. Um, Polar Plunge, I could curse Chris, Kirsten over this one. Um, about four years ago, email comes to me, hey, maybe Maplewood would like to do the polar plunge. I think nobody will do this. No one is jumping into Lake Ontario in February. Um, but you know, just the smallest thing. I, I think I said, if you jump in, I'll knit you a hat. I'm gonna show you guys, I am a terrible knitter. These foolish friends of mine, oh yeah, small thing like that. Then we said, well, let's make it competitive. Who can raise the most money? And uh, if you see the little lady holding Kirsten's hand with the W, uh, that's Marlo. She went around and bugged every staff member, family member, um, and it became really competitive. Um, one of our staff phoned a, a fairly wealthy relative and beat her at the very last minute. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but we just make it really fun. Um, we do have to rely on our friends, our families, our, um, our colleagues for fundraising. Um, but most people are pretty generous. And I think because Special Olympics is such a great cause, um, just, ask, just ask your friends. They will donate. That's what we found. And we were able to raise a substantial amount for Polar Plunge, which we were then able to use for our students. All right, next one. I was going to say die for this one too. That I, this always reminds me of just, I think, uh, as Amanda said, it's promoting, promoting Special Olympics and putting it out into the community. This was a, was a huge, and I'll let you speak to this one in a minute, but I think it's so proud of, of being able to promote Special Olympics, not just within our school, but within the community. And I think it's getting the word out. That's how we're going to get people involved. And, and it's happening. I mean, Special Olympics has grown as, as Kirsten said, we started off at Four Corners years ago. And now it, it's, it's, there's just so many people involved in the school community. It's, uh, it's just so wonderful to see. And here's another way we do it. Yeah. And this is just, you can see, um, we were able to uh, participate in the um, Beaches Christmas Parade, which, believe it or not, is a fundraiser for that community. Um, but when I phoned them and said, you know, we'd like to do this, they totally waived the entry and it was a really fun day. Um, you see parents in the picture, staff, uh, Special Olympics staff came, um, students, athletes. Um, if you, The hand there is, uh, oh, what's his name? Mike Hand. So um, yeah, this is things that, you know, I know you may be, if you're from other parts of Ontario, this is a small parade in Toronto. This is not the big one. Um, but it was really successful and uh, I think helped promote it in the community. And I think Janice is going to finish off talking about, we did yeah. do a partner fundraiser because we did find that we could partner with more affluent communities and schools. Exactly. We just reached out to a local high school and we, we had the police play, um, played our kids, the Special Olympic soccer teams, we divided them up and then uh, the school, which was Moet Collegiate, had a buyout, which was wonderful. And, um, and, and that helped us. The reason I have some Special Olympics um, World Youth Games in there, because is that it, the money was to raise, uh, to be raised for uh, the World Youth Games, which was a wonderful event. So uh, I also just want to thank um, and mention that Special Olympics has Ooh. been amazing at putting out um, activity calendars, Reveal Your Champion, which I'm sure many of the volunteers here may be aware of, and um, the monthly wellness calendar. And that's been used uh, a great deal by our phys ed department and distributed throughout our school as we are a congregated site for all teachers to use for students to keep them active. So those two things are what we're doing now. And we also participated in the virtual basketball and virtual uh, bocce tournaments that were run during COVID. So it's been, uh, it's been great to have uh, Special Olympics still reaching out and doing everything they can do to keep our students and our athletes involved. So thank you. Yeah, I just want to speak to that too. Um, for your own personal use, I have been uh, using those uh, videos and resources. I've been supply teaching, but I've also shared them with colleagues uh, who teach regular phys ed programs. They are loving them. So to the Special Olympics team, thank you so much for all the online educational resources this year. They have uh, really contributed to learning for students who are learning at home. So thank you. <laughs> And I think we're finished. That's great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, that was fantastic. I think, honestly, one of my favorite parts um, about school programs is that every single program is so different. I say that makes my life more uh, interesting because I it's not the same everywhere we go and the same every day. But um, I think it actually shows that, uh, you know, it can be successful no matter what type of uh, atmosphere you're in. Uh, some might be easier than others. Uh, some might be new and some might be old, but um, it's really neat to see things thriving and growing uh, in a variety of different uh, areas and um, and kind of uh, whether that's geographical area or type of school, size of school and stuff like that. So um, I, I really enjoy seeing that. Um, thank you all so much for sharing uh, all of your stories. Um, I'm going to open up the floor uh, to any questions. Um, uh, if, uh, yeah, if you want to use the raise hand feature or just unmute yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, we've got uh, a couple minutes left. Ignore my dog that's barking in the background.
All right. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, no questions. Um, I know most of our presenters uh, put their emails as their names, uh, so feel free to drop them a direct line. Um, if not, uh, if you attended today and you have a question come up, there's a conference email that you would have gotten the link from today. Feel free to respond to that. Um, a lot of us get that, but I will see that come through as well, and I can direct your questions uh, directly towards the person or uh, happy to answer uh, any school questions you have um, Special Olympics related um, on behalf of the school programs team at SO as well. Sue, I've seen you. I just saw you unmute yourself. Did you have a question? It's not a question. It's a comment. Uh, being a former educator, listening to what's going on is just, just so exciting. Just so exciting. And so thank you. Thanks, Sue. That's great. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, a whole bunch of rock stars in our corner all across Ontario. Um, so yes, panelists, uh, thank you so much for for coming on today and sharing your knowledge and uh, everyone that tuned in, thank you for joining us this afternoon and uh, you'll all be put in a draw for a prize uh, from each of the sessions. So uh, good luck uh, with that. And uh, if you haven't already, we've got lots of other sessions going on from now until May the 20th. Uh, so feel free to register. Our next one actually starts at seven o'clock tonight um, and it's on mental health. So uh, yeah. Hopefully uh, we'll see you at a couple more sessions. Our next schools one will be on uh, May the 18th and it focuses on transition from uh, school to community programs. So expect a, a good, uh, another good uh, afternoon of panelists there or evening, that one's in the evening. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. Have a great week. Stay safe. Can't wait to see you all in person at conferences soon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Yeah.